pay more attention if you can uh, to what the user really needs. Episode 153. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking with Tanya Ostanina, user experience designer for LexisNexis. Tanya has a fully established career in architecture, reaching up to a senior associate role before deciding to shift gears and take on human computer interaction design. In 2019, she took her master's degree in human computer interaction and has been awarded the outstanding project prize by the Department of Computer Science at City University for her dissertation on harnessing persuasive technology and mobile app design to foster effective climate change communication. As a UX designer, she is currently working on the user experience of a suite of B2B highly specialized subscription only digital publishing products for LexisNexis UK, as well as helping drive discovery and innovation. Um, In this episode, we discuss what is UX, how her foundation in architecture benefited her career in UX design, and what are the parallels and main differences between UX and architecture design, and what are some of the lessons that architects could be learning from UX designers in improving their user experience. So this is a really interesting conversation that I had with Tanya, um, because it is discussing this crossover into other disciplines and really highlights the incredible value and skill sets that architects can bring into other industries. So sit back, relax and enjoy Tanya Ostanina. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Tanya, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. Excellent, brilliant to um, be speaking with you. Now, this is I'm really excited about this conversation. You've had a really interesting career. Um, yourself and I, we actually met whilst doing our part threes. Um, and since then, you went and you were, you were working at Nicholas Hare Architects at that point, I seem to remember. I was, yeah, yeah, a long time ago. And you you worked there for what best part of a decade? Uh, it was thirteen years. Thirteen years, excellent, yeah. amazing. So, and what was really interesting about this conversation today is that you've you've had a fully established career in architecture, um, reaching a very sort of senior level as a as a designer and architect, and then in twenty nineteen you decided to switch paths and study human computer interaction design. Yes, I did. Yeah, and yeah. and and now you a few years later, you have um, had a career pivot, if you like, and have moved into user experience design, or you, yeah, use, become a user yeah. experience designer. Yes, or UX as it's called, commonly. or UX yeah. as they call it in the industry. Excellent. So, I, and I that, for me, that's a really interesting career path, and it's something that we've spoken a lot about on the show before. Um, is the benefits or architecture as being a kind of polymathematic subject which actually gives you a good foundation for lots of other disciplines and UX design has been one of these um, areas where uh, you know a lot of university courses in architecture they kind of point towards that realm if you like Um, and I can I can see logically how there's lots of um, opportunities for architects to be quite good in that field so I think the first question is what was your career like prior to being UX what was it that had you always been thinking about making this career pivot or did you just wake up suddenly one morning and went that's it I'm done so for me it wasn't it was a very gradual process Uh, I was looking at uh, a number of options that were kind of architecture related and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted wanted to do or whether I even wanted to leave architecture at all. So I mm. started off by just having chats with people and lunches, cups of tea. I went to some open days for some universities. And actually a friend mentioned to me saying, I think you'll be a really good UX designer. And I went like, oh, what is that? <laughs> I'd literally never heard of it. So, uh, and then I started looking into it. Uh, and uh, it, the more I looked into it, the more interesting it became to me and actually uh, as a bit of an anecdote i um, decided to document this in the medium 
post in the blog post, a shameless <sighs> plug, plug here. Brilliant. So, and what happened was that I just kind of put some thoughts down um, in this blog post and just sort of threw it out there into the ether. And then a few days later, Medium contacted me asking me to, if I wanted this to be featured on their front page. I think they've mm. got to work um, kind of medium front page. So, and I said, yes, of course. <laughs> right. And uh, I'm not by no means famous or anything, but what's nice is that since then, every now and then somebody comes across it, even though I wrote it almost two years ago now, I think. Yeah. And they say, and they, the stranger will get in touch and say, I'm thinking about doing the same thing. Can you, can I talk to you? Uh, can you give me some advice? And I'm very happy to do that. Mm. So that was uh, nice and unexpected. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, brilliant. So, so, so what are the, well, let's start with the question, what is UX? Right. So, um, so UX is, um, I guess people outside of tech probably wouldn't have heard of it, just like me. Uh, whereas, for example, everyone thinks they know what an architect does. Um, for UX, it's, uh, it's essentially like designing for digital space or for digital environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that way, it's very similar, whereas architecture, is, you could say it's designing for the physical environment. And this could be any digital product at all from... Um, artificial intelligence to uh, virtual reality, to gaming, to, uh, for example, my boss used to work for the European State uh, Space Agency, and he would do a user research on astronauts. That's also part of UX. So it could literally be anything that's to do with digital design. Right. And uh, what's nice about the, um, the kinds of people who get to work uh, there is that they're very, very eclectic bunch <laughs> in a nice way. Whereas, yeah. for example, in architecture, I think because of these seven years of study, you do end up with slightly more maybe heterogeneous crowd. Mm. Uh, in UX, literally lots of different people stumble into it. So, um, yeah, for example, one of my colleagues used to work for Disney as an animator. Or you get teachers, you get psychologists. Uh, one of my fellow students was an acoustic engineer. And um, so it uh, makes it really quite fun and interesting and lots of different perspectives get brought into it. Amazing. And how did uh, your foundation as an architect um, kind of benefit you in, in UX design? Was it well respected? Was it kind of acknowledged? Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So uh, in my interview, um, I had four stages of interview and every time this question came up because people were just really, really interested. Hmm. Why everybody was asking you, why did you make the switch? And what do you think you can bring to us? And um, I think my answer was and still is that there is quite a lot. Uh, that an architect can bring and uh, just because of our experience in all these different kinds of disciplines and the well-rounded education that we receive so um, and I guess architects generally in our kind of society are somebody who held in really high regard maybe yeah. esoteric or something like this so um, uh, yes definitely definitely helped so, so f what are some of the parallels, would you say, that between UX design and, and architectural design? And if somebody was wanting to do a similar sort of um, mapping, a career mapping, how, what would you suggest that they, they do? Um, parallels? They, um, I mean, there's quite a few. I guess the most obvious one is that they're both creative professions and they're both design-based professions. Yeah. Um, and then I guess you could also talk about the um, parallels in kind of space. When I was talking about digital versus physical space, that can mm -hmm. take many different forms. And so, for example, like one very obvious example to an architect will be building information modeling. It's literally recreating the different aspects of physical space in a digital environment. And of course, you'll get uh, the tech teams and uh, teams of UX designers working on that product. And then they create something that's something like the actual physical reality, but is not. Yeah. And I guess from there, there is um, there's an interesting, more philosophical thought about uh, what does it mean to recreate a physical experience, but in a digital way. And I guess in the pandemic, that's become more and more important because lots of people, for example, are working from home. And they can't attend big gigs or they can't attend meetings. And so, um, so my office actually um, I had an interesting experience, which was related to that, that um, brought some thoughts um, on that front, which was that they're a really big international corporation mm -hmm. and they have a large wing, which is based in London. And so the London um, part of it, they like to go to these big town halls every year 
and they hire a big venue where you know thousands of people in the same venue, and it's apparently like a stadium atmosphere, and it's really amazing. And you get big speeches and stuff. So last year they didn't do it, uh, but this year they tried to recreate it digitally because we're all working from home. So yeah. they had this platform which tried to, I forgot the name of it, but it was basically trying to recreate the same thing, but on your laptop screen. Uh, so you have a big hall space and then you have breakout rooms and you sit at the virtual table and you can unmute yourself and show your face and have a chat. And it was kind of like some bits of it worked really well and other bits maybe not so well. And of course, it didn't feel anything like being in the space with people. Mm. And so I guess... It's an interesting thing here where you, how do you, even if you do all the tick boxes, you have the sound and you can have the vision or maybe the smell even, I don't know. Uh, and then this, if you, even if you do all these things in a digital way, would it really bring you the same kind of experience? Mm. So, and I've seen lots of people try and resolve it. Like, for example, VR is really bigger than them for that reason. So, but not, not really seeing anything that's really kind of, got it yet so yeah. that's something i'd really like to see and maybe like architects and ux designers could collaborate on some project to do this that's re that's really interesting um and obviously this they're kind of as we're moving our lives more and more into the virtual virtual world it seems like a a logical step for architects to be playing um a, you know a significant role or being able to contribute various skill sets into the creation and curation of of digital digital spaces yeah absolutely yeah and there's further opportunities here, of course, because we live, um, I don't know if you've heard the phrase of the Internet of Things, right, where we live yeah. surrounded by devices, digital devices that are co you know, connected to the web and, um, and how is that used and how does that contribute to the actual physical experience of being somewhere. Mm. So, and I guess smart cities is part of that. This is when you have large scale data from uh, different uh, devices or different uh, items in the physical space and how do they make, you know, the people, the users or people who live in the city are better off. So. Um, so w w when you were studying, did you take a full two years out of work to study or did you um, do it whilst working? How did it, how did it work? And uh, it was actually one year. One it, year. Was it was full time. So this particular course is at City University here in London. And you can either do part time, which is very helpful for some people. But mm -hmm. I decided to go full on. So um, I took a whole year and it's I'm glad I did because so, <laughs> it is very, very intense. I mean, and it's a brilliant experience. And, and, and so you kind of you, you handed in your resignation notice and, and said goodbye. And your, your colleagues were like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually voluntary redundancy. I got it. Uh, got it. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, everyone was very curious, and uh, and it, yeah, they were asking me, kind of, to get back to them and and tell them how it went and what can architects learn from UX designers. They were mm -hmm. also very interested about that. And and was the uh, was the was the idea then when you started studying it? you were going to go full on and change your career or was it more just studying for interest to begin with? Mm, it was full on. Yeah. I decided on. I was going to do this uh, and it, yeah, it's worked out for me, thankfully. Excellent. And in, and in terms of career um, sort of levels, if you like, were you able to enter into a UX role at a similar level where you left off architecture or have you had to kind of start at the beginning as a, as a young trainee UX designer and now you're having to work your way back up or um I started at the beginning right and actually yeah I kind of landed a job even before graduating which was lucky for me but um um it's uh, I was told that I came across very well in the interviews and mm -hmm. uh, because of the kind of the people skills that architects develop over the years and that has worked really well for me mm -hmm. but what was lacking is the UX design isn't really a simple discipline it's deceptive because in a way, there is no bar for entry. So you can call yourself a UX designer tomorrow. It doesn't mean you'll be any good. And that's right. the issue here because kind of the sub subtlety and the complexity of it is similar to architecture. And its role in uh, organizations is a vast. So literally UX can make or break a product. Right. Okay. So it can, it can be quite far reaching in terms of its application. Yes, exactly. So I guess when I started off, I actually thought maybe it'll be easy. 
I was a bit naive, so I thought, <laughs> well, I can just waltz in. You know, how hard can it be? You know, I used to be really senior, and it, it's not really been like that. It's, I've had a really amusing journey, I guess, because in the first month, I was literally Googling every single thing that was said to me because I could not understand what was being said. There's quite a lot of jargon and there's quite a lot of very technical stuff, some of which I didn't need to know, as it turns out. Yeah. But I didn't know that at the time. So, for example, the uh, so I work with three developer teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, at some point, they were talking about adding Terraform compliance to the structure of our pipelines. And I'm like, I don't know where I am. <laughs> it's like the oil executive meeting. It's not actually anything about oil pipelines at all. But uh, I still don't entirely know what it means. But now I realize that it's nothing to do with UX. So I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> so, um, so, yes. And... Um, so in terms of your starting uh, at the lower level, there was definitely the right decision for my company to hire me at a lower level, just because the learning curve is very steep. Yeah. And also they take UX very seriously. So mm -hmm. in the industry, it's called UX maturity levels and not everybody's at the high level, which I guess is also different from architecture because in architecture, if you work on a um, large scale project, you have to have one mm -hmm. in tech. It depends on where your organization is at. So mine, I was very lucky. There's a big UX team and I have a lot of support, which I do need. Mm -hmm. So um, just because, um, I guess for my company, if you make a UX decision that's wrong, you might lose some customers, yeah. which not, might not be the end of the world, but it's not great. Yeah. Uh, but for example, in some other professions, um, which are UX related, if you make a mistake, it can be absolutely dire. Right. Uh, so I don't know if you remember, there was a news story a few uh, years ago about the Hawaii missile alert. Oh, yes. Yeah, that so, was, yeah. That was, that was, that was, that, um, was it North Korea had launched a... Uh, Something like that, yeah. So they had uh, a text message sent to every single mobile phone on Hawaii saying that a missile is imminent and they need to evacuate and it caused mass panic. People were running away and it transpired that a person who was working for this emergency alert organization had pressed the wrong button because he thought that was really an, a, a real alert happening and there wasn't. But what's interesting about this is that this story is quoted a lot in UX circles because when they looked into the reasons for uh, what happened, they realized that the interface wasn't designed very well. Mm -hmm. well. Firstly, it was very easy to misinterpret information. And secondly, it was very easy to submit it without proper checks being made. Right. So when this was discovered, there was like a big uproar in the UX circles to say this person wasn't at fault. It's the design's fault. Yeah. And because people love scapegoats, he lost his job anyway. <laughs> uh, but definitely in UX, there's a very large drive about it's never the user's fault. It's always the design's fault. So this is why the weight of UX is really big and getting things right is really important. And I, I suppose that the um, one of the differences with UX and architecture then is the, is the pace of development. Um, I would I would imagine that there's a higher things you know you you kind of you're able to go through iterations faster than you are in architecture in many ways. Yes, very good point. Okay. Yeah, so this is one of the differences, big differences between the two industries, and in general, this is construction versus tech. Yeah, because uh, so in, in tech you often hear the words agile versus waterfall. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've heard of either, but no, essentially what, what, this what, is what it is. What does each mean? So waterfall is what construction does. So this is when you have, and certainly in the old school um, um, uh, kind of construction contract, where you would have the designs developed at the beginning and for a very long time, a number of months or maybe even years, the whole design team with the architects in it, they would perfectly work out every single thing. And then they'll pass it on to the construction company and they will build it. So what can happen, of course, is I'm sure you know, as well as anyone, if you make a mistake early on, to unpick it later on can be very, very expensive or even impossible, and it yeah. can cost a lot of money. So, but in a way, um, this process might be inevitable in construction, just because the nature of construction, once you put it in the ground, it's there. And yeah. uh, but I suppose also you've got design and build, and other slightly alternative types of contracts where the process is more continuous. Mm -hmm. So agile is basically like the extreme version of that. Just because, in, certainly in software, the site development cycle is very, very fast. So um, in my office, I don't know if it's the same everywhere, but it's two, two weeks. And wow. literally, yeah, they're building kind of little things. 
very, yeah. very quickly. And the two week turnaround, then they finish them and they want more, more things. So the designer will supply the next phase. And of course, as, as a UX designer, you have to adapt to that. That sounds quite exciting. It's so, uh, yeah, it's slightly dizzying. It's very, very quick. So, and, and I suppose as well, you get to get real time feedback from actual users and people, which we don't get in architecture. It's not like you, you really get to test your building out with the, the end user and then true, go and redesign yeah. it. Once it's designed and people are using it, that's it. It's kind of locked into position. Where it's, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing mm. you, you might have stages or iterations where you're, you're able to kind of keep updating a piece of software. Um, as you're getting feedback in real time from clients and customers. Absolutely, yeah, that's how we run things. So um, we use um, a uh, tool called Full Story, which is a web analytics tool, because our product is essentially like a giant digital library, and it's all on it's all on the web, uh, so you can monitor it using this tool. And it's um, it's so detailed that it anonymizes all of the users, but you can literally watch an individual user do something on screen and move things, and you can see where they get confused. Mm. Sometimes you can't quite figure out what they're doing or why they get confused, but that's why you can get people in. So we have a user testing in my company, and we have a team of user researchers who uh, get the actual uh, people, and they either ask them to do tasks or they do interviews with them and get that data. So literally everything is as data-driven as possible. Right. And as a designer, you're encouraged not to ever rely on just gut feeling. You need to justify everything that you do. Just because if you get it wrong, then you can get bad consequences. I like that. Great. So uh, have you met any other architects who have made the same journey? Oh, good question. Um, sort of is the answer. When In the beginning, when I was looking around, I met a few who were thinking of doing a transition. I don't know if they did in the end or not. I also met some people on LinkedIn and I connected with them because they had a similar journey. And I'm very keen to meet more. So if you know anybody, send them my, my way. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be people um, listening to this as well that will, that will have a, a similar sort of desire um, and want. It's been interesting. I interviewed a few months back, actually, somebody in South Africa, an architect who had started to learn um, Python coding. And, and again, there's, there's, there's a kind of a big... And there's a lot of architects in now who are realizing there's a, so much potential in the world of tech. Um, obviously, career prospects can be quite favorable in tech when you compare them to architecture. And there's a lot mm. of a lot of mm. growth, both in terms of what you're able to be working on and the diversity of different projects, um, integrating like um, like Nick was, you know, tech and artificial intelligence into construction. Um, oh, interesting as well as lots of other things. Have you found the, the kind of, were you, were you feeling prior to the move that your prospects in architecture had maybe a ceiling on them or that this wasn't, this wasn't the profession you had, you'd hoped for, or was it actually you were, you were thoroughly content and it was just a, a change of heart um, or change of. Yeah. I mean, I suppose there probably was a ceiling. Uh, I was working in a medium sized company, it was 30 or 40 people, and it had a senior management in it, the partners. Yeah. And I was just a level below that. So I guess, unless I wanted to become a partner one day, which I will, I'm not sure if I was. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, but if I did, I could have perhaps been lucky enough or worked hard enough to become one. And probably after that, this is it. Yeah. Uh, and of course, in architecture, you can move to different types of architecture. So my, my office was mostly education and, and offices. Uh, and, um, uh, but yeah, I guess in tech, what really, really was attractive to me is just that it, it at least in the beginning, perhaps it feels like you can do almost anything. Mm -hmm. And certainly the uh, master's course I did was very much gearing us towards that, which was wonderful. Uh, so for example, the, um, so one of the professors in my, um, department did a big project working with people with aphasia, which is sort of speech difficulty after a stroke. So they'll have trouble communicating. So she and her team designed a video game, uh, which um, had these people participating in it. And then gradually they would relearn some of the uh, communication skills by doing different tasks, like going to a bar, a virtual bar, buying a drink or going to dances or, uh, yeah, it was a really wonderful project. 
and very successful. So when you see this kind of stuff, it's really inspiring and you go, oh, wow, I can do this. So, and uh, yeah, another fun one was um, there is a Microsoft lab in Cambridge that mm. another lecturer of mine used to collaborate with. And they did a study on how people retain memories, including photographs or anything like that around the home. So and how can you incorporate that into a digital memory design of some kind? Uh, so that was all really good fun. I ended up doing um, basically digital library sort of by yeah. accident, just because the job found me, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm really enjoying it. And what's fun about it is that of course, not just the scale, cause it's really enormous. So, uh, so my company is called LexisNexis and they've got like hundreds of billions of documents out there, uh, which is quite overwhelming. <laughs> uh, I don't have to look at them all, but I have to think about designs that fit all of them. So, so, so what does your current company do? They're the, a, a digital library? Yeah, they're, so they're basically a giant a digital library for the legal profession around the world. Right. Um, and uh, they have a UK uh, wing, which deals with UK law. And it's, as I understand, it's one of the largest resources used by lawyers uh, everywhere, and including university degrees and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So... The, um, yeah, I guess uh, one of the fun parts of it, sometimes you get this kind of more philosophical stuff, which I love. So, the, uh, for example, I did the user test uh, with um, one of my users a couple of um, months ago, mm -hmm. and they started waxing lyrical about the serendipity of books. And of course, my <laughs> company also publishes books, physical books, and he just goes... It's just so wonderful to pick up a book and just leaf through that and you have the smell of a book and you can see this thing that you didn't expect to see. And then he sort of looks at me and goes, well, how are you trying to recreate that in your digital product? Yeah. Is it possible? And I'm like, there's a thought. So yeah, yeah, this stuff comes up. And of course, it's at the back of my mind. And we as a design team, we're thinking about how to bring some of that in, even though it's not the smell of a book, but something mm. like that might be possible. Amazing. So, it's, so it's in, it can be incredibly creative and you're, you're kind of, again, very much focused on the experience of somebody moving and operating inside of these digital worlds, if you like. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of uh, the pay, so this is obviously something that architects talk a lot about is their, 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 either their fees if you're running your own business or the pay of an architect. Is the pay similar or is there kind of you know again same thing in architecture there is there's high levels of becoming partners and owners of running your own business where your where your pay your salary is not really you know depending on how good a business person you are and what, what markets you're working in there is there is kind of high levels is it what's the pay like um it very much depends on where you are to be right. honest uh so um because my company is large the pay will be better yeah. Uh, at lower levels, it's it's sl probably slightly better than than architects, and at higher levels, it's it's a lot better. So when right. you become senior in UX, you earn more than an average architect. Yeah. Um. So. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. No, I, I've got a, a number of um. Speak to a number of people out in in San Francisco. Um. Who obviously there's a lot of UX designers in that in that part of the world, probably. Oh yes, well, yes, yeah, Silicon Valley's got its own its own rules. Its own, <laughs> so it's its own salaries. Yeah, here in London, it's not as high. So yeah, when I said when it depends on where you are, of course, if you work for a small startup, you have to accept a startup salary because they won't be able to afford to pay you a lot, and you'll probably work longer hours and they'll be a lot more intense, but maybe more fun, more experimental. Yeah, and you might get equity in the business. Long, yes, long, yeah. long term and that kind of that kind of operations so that's so that's interesting that that you think there's more it sounds like there's more range if you like in term and diversity and possibility for kind of varied varied salaries definitely yes i mean corporate jobs are very very popular precisely because you get a better pay and also you get a lot of corporate cushions which are quite nice yeah. uh, and that, I'm, I'm new to this so i'm very much enjoying that <laughs> so, and that could be anything from paid time off, for example, we had summer hours in my office where you basically get given a few days off to do whatever you like. So lovely. Enjoy the summer. Oh, fantastic. And have you have any, any thoughts about returning back to architecture? Do you miss it? Um, a bit, I guess. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Yeah. Um, what, what, what are what, some of the elements that you miss about architecture that 
Um, I think the physicality of it, I do miss. The um, Perhaps it's also because I've, I've only started my job during the pandemic, so I've never actually been in my office yet. Ah. I mean, it's imminent. It's, yep. I've got a big office in Farringdon, and uh, they are reopening it gradually. Um, whereas in architecture, and, and apparently it is similar, so it's like a studio. You sit next to your fellow UX designers and you have chats all day long. I guess that part I miss. And also the excitement of being on site, I think I miss a lot. Mm. When you're literally walking amongst your creation <laughs> and you point fingers and you go, this isn't quite right. And that, you know, <laughs> you kind of feel this power there. It's, um, I think in tech, to be honest, the relationship between UX designers and the development is different. Mm-hmm. Even though architect is not king, as we know. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in, in tech, the UX designer is not really king. They, mm. uh, they kind of like, they work collaboratively and often the product uh, managers will be driving the direction of where the product is going and the UX designer will be asked to uh, follow that. So, so who is, who is the king, the king in the world of UX is more the, on the development side, the developer. The... <laughs> I wouldn't say that there is a king, I guess. Yeah. They're meant to work collaboratively, I guess. Uh, ultimately the business will make big decisions right? and that will be out of my hands. So, and I'll be expected to respond to those. Again, if I worked in a smaller company, I probably would have a lot more sway into where things are going. And of course, because everything is supposed to be data driven, mm-hmm. if your data as a UX researcher shows a particular thing, then you communicate that and you say, this is really, really important. We need to fix that or we need to respond to that. Mm-hmm. And that's where your power really comes from as a UX designer or researcher. Got it. Got it. Okay. And so that's data kind of, that would be linked back to, to what sorts of things, what sorts of data are you interested in as a UX designer? Um, lots of different data. It's about users ultimately. So my job is to serve the needs of the user and try to understand what these needs are, which isn't always easy. Mm-hmm. So, for example, I mentioned full story where we observe users do different things. And I mentioned um, uh, getting people in to, um, to use the product and see where they're struggling. Um, there is also actually some really interesting theories out there at the moment that my office is trying to adopt. So, for example, there was this um, book that I've read recently uh, called uh, Competing Against Luck mm-hmm. by Clayton Christensen, I think. And he created this framework, I suppose, called Jobs to be Done, which is really popular in tech at the moment. Uh, And that's essentially like a very much um, in-depth ethnographic approach to this, when you never, ever ask users, you never ask your customers what they want because you expect that they don't know that. Right. So and he gives us and he gives us anecdotes in the beginning of the book I think where he was hired uh, by McDonald's actually so nothing to do with tech but nevertheless to improve the milkshake this was well before Brexit so <laughs> <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the milkshake shortages so um, and this was in the states so and because they initially what they did uh, was uh, called market research so they they got some customers they asked them what do you want in your new milkshake and the customers would say oh I want it was you know purple sparkles or something. So they went ahead and did all that. And then their sales didn't improve at all. And they were really puzzled. I think, what did we do wrong? We asked them what we, they wanted. So they asked um, this author, Christensen, to um, get involved. So what he did instead, instead of asking anybody any questions, he went and sat at a McDonald's for 18 hours on one day. <laughs> uh, must have been very tired by the end of it. Just observing. You're going to see all sorts and, of stuff sitting in the I'm sure, yeah. for 18 hours. <laughs> yeah, no, especially it was a drive, drive by, I think, in, uh, in, uh, somewhere in America. But so what, what you actually saw was uh, that these milkshakes were bought by, um, most of them were bought before 7.30 a.m. And the kind of person that would come and buy them would always be the same kind of person. It would be a single person. Mm-hmm. They would come in the car, they would run in, they would get a milkshake and they would drive off. So he was really puzzled by that. So he started trying to uh, stop these people and ask them. But instead of asking them what they wanted in a milkshake, he would ask them this like slightly convoluted question, which is, what job did you hire this milkshake to do? Right, got it. So, and there would be like, oh, well, I'm a commuter and I'm really bored. I haven't had any food yet. And because, you know, it's in the States, they have long driving commutes. So um, basically, I'm just looking for something that I can hold with one hand that isn't boring uh, so I can drive um, using the other hand and also fill me up uh, for the rest of the morning. 
And what's what's interesting about this anecdote is because, of course, once he found that out, his recommendations were very, very different. Mm. So um, he, for example, he said that, so your milkshake is not competing with another milkshake. It's competing with maybe a banana or a bagel or something. So whatever you do, you do what a banana or bagel does. So, <laughs> and apparently they did that, whatever that was, I, d- I don't know. And that was actually really successful. And like any of their previous efforts. Um, Brilliant. So yeah, I guess the moral of the story is that you don't know what your customer or user really needs. Mm. They might tell you what they want, but well, they well, what they need is very different. Well, this is very interesting as well, because in this kind of a, a, a quite a difference between architecture and and UX design and and the world of software. The world of software kind of is intimately more linked real time with end users, and there's more of a business and entrepreneurial marketing drive right so like the example you're talking about here with kind of product development and trying to understand the needs and uses the needs of of the of the client and the end customer um it's it's quite a difficult difficult a different frame from in architecture where we're always speculating about what the end user wants yes yeah um, we, ne- we never, and when it's, once we've built something, there's a lack, if you like, of feedback from the end user. And then also the people that we're dealing with tend to be clients who are paying to get the building built and they might not necessarily be the end user themselves. They might just be the owner of owner of a building and their, their kind of intentions is very different from, um, you know, the, the, the kind of tenant or the person who's actually going to be inhabiting the building or experiencing it. Absolutely, yeah. And yeah, in contrast, I found that when I moved into UX, yeah, this process was so much more thorough mm. to the point when you even have this dedicated profession, which is UX research, who, who literally they do nothing else with their time. And in architecture, even though, yeah, of course, when you're gathering, you know, your information in the beginning, when you have all these briefing chats with the clients and you meet some of the users some of the time, you do have that. But the process is a lot more, less kind of it's a lot less in depth. Yeah. Um, I don't know why that is because looking back, I would have liked to see more of that. And mm. of course, because a lot of mistakes may have been prevented and the building may have ended up being a better building. Uh, but again, there needs to be this recognition that you need to spend this resource because it costs a lot. Like research takes forever. And um, I did a relatively small study and it took me, I think, three weeks overall, just doing nothing else, just doing that. So, so until that, yeah, until that recognition happens, um, I guess architecture will remain doing what it's doing at the moment. That's that's really interesting. What what other lessons do you think architects could be learning from from UX designers? Mm, or, or, or if I yeah, put it, if I put it, if I put the question another way, if you were to go back into architecture, what would you be encouraging the business that you worked for or your own business to be doing more of? Yeah, very good question. Yeah, I think that would be the number one uh, taking. It's they pay more attention, if you can, yeah. uh, to what the user really needs. Again, there's so many constraints about this, of course, as you know, uh, mm. because often you're, you're restricted into who you can speak to and uh, when you can speak to them and the format. So I suppose architects could go out and observe people use similar buildings and learn from that. Mm-hmm. Um, um, let me think of anything else. Um, well, it, well it, I suppose it's interesting as well, like how would architecture become more data-driven? <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. How can it become data-driven? I guess um, certainly if you build something, even though you can't undo it, uh, I know, I forgot the name, but when you go back and you kind of review uh, how the yeah, building is used. Your, your sort of post-occupancy. Uh, post-occupancy, yeah, yeah, evaluation, that's right, yeah. So that I remember that being done on on. The, um, quite a few of the buildings that I worked on, but it was also a little bit maybe patchy. It was maybe once a month in the beginning and then it became once a year and then it kind of dwindled into nothing. Mm. Um, but if that's done more intensely, uh, perhaps uh, some of the lessons can be taken on to the next phase. But also I think very interesting, I think BIM could play a really good role in that in the future. Perhaps not yet, but mm. because there's this aspect of, of BIM, which is a virtual reality. And coming back to my kind of musings on can you really recreate what it's like being in a space? If that is ever resolved more fully, I think there's a real opportunity to allow the users to wander around your virtual building and mm-hmm. really feel what it's like and really feel 
if it's the right kind of thing for them and like maybe even try to use it. So I don't know, like sit on a virtual chair, <laughs> it's, you know, and again, it's the physicality. It's not just looking around and seeing it. It's also touching it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just really getting the feel of what it's like to be in the space. Brilliant. Brilliant. Tanya, I think that's a, the perfect place to conclude the, the conversation. They're really interesting and, you know, really inspiring to hear, um, you know, because it, it takes a lot to, you know, to, to, to change path like that. Um, and it's really inspiring to, to see someone doing it and doing it so effortlessly and doing it so well. And uh, really interesting to hear your insights. Well, from- thank you very much. If, yeah, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, uh, please do. Yeah, I'm very happy to talk to people about career transitioning or just about UX uh, or any related subject. So send, my, send them my way. Brilliant. What's the best way they get in contact with you? Um, probably email. Um, okay. I don't know if it's possible to submit that as yeah. part of the um, we can put it description. In the, yeah. We can put it in the information. Excellent. Tanya, thank okay. you so much. Thank you very much. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.